What's going on guys? Merrick here back with episode 13 of our History of the Dragon Ball Super mini series. I noticed that when we did uh, our video on set 5 that it got a little bit lengthy um, just because it felt like there was more stuff being thrown into into the game uh, starting with set 5. Set 3 and 4, like they had stuff sprinkled in here and there but it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of support for each archetype. Uh, let's look at green especially for set 3. There was just kind of a whole bunch of different things in there but with set five and set six uh, and then going into set seven we got a lot more support some more dedicated support to each archetype and there were a lot more cards that were almost necessary for the combo whereas some of the older sets the cards weren't necessary um, you could just run uh, you could pick and choose kind of which ones you needed but as the game kind of has been progressing we've been getting to a better state in the game where uh, archetypes had better support. You weren't having to look to other sets or other colors to get what you needed to be able to functionally run the deck. And so it kind of added a little bit more for us to discuss. So I'm going to make this into two parts, uh, like what I did with set five, uh, except I'm actually going to organize this into set part, into two parts. So for set six, we're going to do red, blue, green, and yellow, and then we'll do black, the starter decks, all the special cards uh, in part two. Red was one of those colors where in set 6, I didn't have a whole lot of interest in playing either of the decks, mostly because of the characters, but they had some really powerful effects. Even now, uh, Red, Gogeta, BR is one of the stronger competitors as far as, like, in a higher level play. And then even the Frieza Prison deck is getting uh, to be just an, a pain in the ass to deal with, and it's up there in the top tier as well. Um, I don't, I, I don't know, for some reason, me, I can't play the leader. I can't play that deck. I tried it. Uh, I even tried my own variant. I just, it's one of those things that I can't play because it doesn't suit my kind of play style. It's, it's one of those things where you're playing the long game, and to me, it feels just like uh, you're just stalling out for Janimba, or uh, same thing with, like, the, the Victory Strike and the, the Gogeta Shenron decks. The Red Gogeta BR leader was... A really well done leader, I feel like. Uh, I really could appreciate the unawakened side. You could discard a red Goku or Vegeta BR, draw two cards, and choose a card in your life and add it to your hand. So it helped you awaken, and it gave you a plus two uh, just to drop a card so it kind of fueled your sparking. And it was just a really powerful unawakened ability. Uh, the draw one, untap one is kind of eh. I feel like I would, honestly I'd rather untap two of course. But the one and one just feels weird. Uh, I guess it's just because we were so used to untap two or draw two before that and so it was kind of one of those things where this kind of seemed like an undesirable option at the time but again everybody was so, <clears throat> if you guys remember way back in set three or before the release of set 3, everybody was shitting on uh, untapped 2 leaders and because they weren't getting the draw 2, and so I guess this is just kind of the standard, people are going to complain uh, about one thing or another, but it seems to kind of start being like a balance issue now, to where you're drawing one, untapping one, which I'm not, I'm not a terrible, I'm not terribly opposed to it. On the Awakened side though, uh, you get to choose a card in your hand, place it in your drop area, and if you had 2 or more Goku and Vegeta in your drop area, uh, your opponent couldn't activate counter skills and she costed two or more for the duration of the turn. Now that really didn't matter too terribly much at the release of set six. However, now, now with set seven and we've got all these counter plays and I feel like, or even the, uh, the, the, the counter, not just the counter play extra cards, but the counter play battle cards as well. This Gogeta leader is phenomenal. He's got he's got a serious place uh, in the meta, I feel like, just because he's his his ability actually matters. And it almost seems like they gave us this leader in preparation for that. <sighs> Again, I really don't like the idea of giving Bandai that much credit for thinking that far ahead, planning that far ahead. But who knows, maybe they are. Maybe they're smarter than we give them credit for, and maybe some of the issues we've been having is just stuff that was overlooked, or in hindsight, they were just like, well, this isn't going to be really that overpowered. Uh, but then it turns out they were wrong. Maybe. Maybe that's what this leader was for. 
Uh, I kind of don't like that it requires that you have to basically running a uh, red Gogeta BR deck uh, to be able to counter those. But that's kind of what this game needs. Is it needs more specific ways to run a deck or run a leader than for everything to just be generic. The Goji to BR strategy was pretty straightforward. It had a pretty linear uh, playstyle. Uh, your first turn was always going to consist of prepping for fusion, Goku and Vegeta. Uh, both of them let you look at the top three cards of the deck and add a Veku or the other uh, to your hand. And then you have to return it back to your hand at the end of the turn. That was uh, strictly for being able to play the card, get its effects, uh, but also keeping them in your hand to be able to use them for the uh, Union Fusion ability. Turn 2, you'd go into Preemptive Strike Goku or Vegeta. They both had uh, the same sparking ability, which would allow you to look at the top 5 cards of your deck, add a Gogeta or a Goku slash Vegeta to your hand, and uh, then shuffle your deck. And if you did, you just had to drop a card in the drop area. And then, depending on whether you played Goku or Vegeta, you either got plus 5,000 power for the Goku, or the Vegeta allowed you, you to uh, add minus 5,000 power to one of your opponent's battle cards, ignoring Barrier. So if you played it early on, you get rid of some of their weak little guys. Uh, the Goku will allow you to attack over some little guys. And honestly, just, I don't know, for something about the art on these cards is fantastic. Especially the Goku. The foil for the, the Goku, the Super Saiyan God, just looks absolutely amazing. The 2 and 3 drops are where you kind of could switch up your playstyle a little bit. Uh, when it came to Harmonic Energy, Goku and Vegeta, uh, their Sparking 3 allows you to look at the top 7 cards and add a Goku Vegeta to your hand and then shuffle your deck. So it kind of helped you uh, to add more cards to your hand. So you had a massive hand either for comboing, for playing more battle cards, for uh, fusion. And also, uh, it, it kind of kept you from uh, losing your cards because with everything being added to your hand, you could combo them, you could protect your life in any way you wanted to. And with the Goku and Vegeta playstyles, uh, the Goku was always the more aggressive one, it kind of felt like. Uh, the first one, you know, gained 5,000 power with the 2-drop, but then the 3-drop gained 10,000 power and could attack active battle cards. So that meant you could KO blockers or KO some weak shit they were trying to keep alive, uh, whether for uh, evolution or fusion of their own or union or, you know, what have you. Uh, where the Vegeta, on the other hand, was all about just straight-up KOing their battle cards, whereas the 2-drop uh, gave minus 5,000 power to any card. The 3-drop gave minus 10,000. This was especially effective if you went first, because since you'd be one turn up on your opponent, uh, you'd be able to play this and on cards that they only had two energy to play, and most of the time you could just outright KO them with the ability, and if you wanted to attack, you could, and if not, you could still just bounce the card back to your hand and just proceed with your turn. But you were still forcing your opponent to lose cards, whether you did that or whether you played the Goku and just ran it right over. Either way, it gave you options. Uh, which is good in this game, uh, while still following the same linear playstyle to get to the goal. Uh, fusing into either Fat or Skinny Veku, uh, both of them just required a Goku and Vegeta BR. Uh, there was no energy cost to play them. Uh, you could only play one of them uh, per turn. And the, the Fat one could also attack battle cards in active mode, so I feel like he was a little bit better to play. Uh, but because you could play them both, because they cost no energy, I would say, honestly, going to the skinny one and then the fat one, or vice versa, uh, if they actually had any battle cards, it would just depend on what you had, or what they had you wanted to KO, uh, because you could just place the card in the drop area and add a Goku and Vegeta BR to your hand. So, it was almost like playing him just to KO stuff and then adding them straight back. It was supposed to be thematic... Uh, to go along with them fusing into the Veku and it failing, and then them unfusing going back to your hand. So it's it's kind of cool. I like that they do stuff like that when it comes to the card effects. Uh, now the skinny Veku, in place of being able to attack active battle cards like the fat one, uh, he would allow you to choose an opponent's battle card and give it minus 10,000 power. So you got some additional like uh, power level KO factor in there. Both of them uh, suited specific needs, but overall it still allowed you to play in a relatively similar fashion uh, to eventually get to the Gogeta. Once you got to turn 4, your main 
play was always going to be the 6-drop Gogeta, because uh, he would cost 4 energy, you would draw 2 cards to fuse in him, and he could not be KO'd and could attack battle cards in active mode. And when he attacked a battle card, he also switched to active mode once per turn. So he was really just a monster of a card because he couldn't be KO'd, he would attack active battle cards. The only way to get rid of him was to basically warp him or to play a card that bounced him back to the hand or under the, you know, bottom of the deck or something. Still a really powerful card. He didn't have Barrier, but of course you could run uh, the Universe 7 uh, extra card from Tournament of Power and give all your red cards Barrier. Not that he really needs it, but if you really wanted that extra, extra level of support uh, and protection, that would be your main play. Now once you got to the 4-drop, you would go into Fusion Onslaught, and this card, you could EX Evolve him straight from... The 6 drop. So you could attack once, switch him back to active mode, EX evolve into this one, who you chose two red cards from your hand and place them in the drop area. So the two cards you drew from the 6 drop basically served as the discard fodder for the 8 drop. And again, this card also could attack battle cards in active mode and could not be KO'd. And it's ridiculous because he's a 35,000 power. Now, if he just said he couldn't be KO'd by skills or something, fine. You can't even attack over him. You could dump 100,000 power, still not kill him. Now, once he evolved, he had one of the more devastating effects. Uh, you, if you had no battle cards in your opponent's battle area, uh, you got two, two cards from their life, place them in the drop area. So, you got to crit your opponent for two lives. So it was very, very terrifying. You could not let your opponent get you to two life uh, unless you had just an enormous amount of battle cards in play. The only problem is, this card got to switch back to active mode every single time he attacked a battle card. So, it didn't matter what it was. It didn't matter if it was a revenge blocker. It didn't matter if it was a deadly defender. It didn't matter if you could combo to keep it alive. There was no way to keep anything alive once this Gogeta hits the board. He can attack active battle, so you can't protect your cards that way. This card was just an like insanely powerful monster. Now again, you could warp a card... Or you could warp him with a card, or you could bounce him with a card, but if it, you, that was the only way to get around him. Uh, the only other way was once they ran out of cards to attack, they attacked the leader. Uh, you pretty much had to just rush them and just hit them in the face repeatedly and hope you could kill them before they could just go back to doing all that shit all over again. For those of you that didn't want to play an aggressive deck and instead were a little more reserved in your playstyle, we had the new Frieza Majestic Emperor. This card didn't even allow you to have any card in your deck with energy cost of 3 or less. That even included super combos. Everything, extra cards, battle cards, all had to have uh, an energy cost of 4 or more. Uh, and once per turn you got to look at the top 5 cards of your deck, choose a red extra card and add it to your hand. So, right there you could choose any red extra card, whether it be uh, counters or anything like that. Luckily, luckily this leader can't take advantage of all the new counter plays because that would just be too much I feel like um, and then on his awakened side uh, you get to choose a red freezes army place in the drop area and you can negate the attack of a battle card uh, once per turn and it was just kind of it's like this leader did so much but it revolved around such a slow defensive playstyle that I just I could not get on board with and I tried I tried different ways to build the deck there just there was just nothing that I liked in it the deck itself that I built was would be fun um, just swapping up a few cards and maybe playing with like the red clash of fates Frieza leader but honestly this this Frieza leader just it was just not it not fun for me uh, that doesn't mean it's not good because by all means, it's a great deck, and you see it putting it, putting in work uh, at regionals and qualifiers and other big events. But it's just it's a deck that you have to have an acquired taste for, and for me, it just tastes awful. The Frieza cards themselves, however, were pretty fantastic. I really liked their abilities. You had the seven drop Frieza, a double strike. And if you had five or more extra red cards, you got to reduce him by one. If there were ten or more, you got to reduce him by two. So you play him on turn five. And when you played him, if your leader was a red Frieza's army, you got to choose all of your opponent's battle cards, uh, or all battle cards with uh, 25,000 power or less, other than him ignoring barrier and KO them. So he killed everything on the board, yours and your opponent's. Now, what I like is, see, this is what I was talking about earlier, is it just requires a red Freezes army. 
So you can still play uh, the Clash of Fates Frieza Leader, which kind of opens up what you can run a little bit if you don't want to play the super stally defensive Frieza deck. Uh, and no, don't take this the wrong way. It's no offense against anybody that does like to play that. To me, it's just... <sighs> Playing a deck like that is no more fun than playing against a deck like that. There's no interaction. There's no back and forth. Um, it just, I don't know, it just feels like, it feels like when you're sitting there with your deck, you shuffle, 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 you look at your hand, you know, you, you play test like the first turn or two, you can see what you can do, but there's nobody on the other side of that table, there's not another deck, you're just kind of making up scenarios and you're going, okay, turn one, they might play a battle card, turn two, they might play another battle card, they might attack with their leader, it, it just, there, it didn't feel like there was anybody playing on the other side. And then you had the seven, uh, you had the eight drop, the EX Evolve, which, whoo, it's a nasty card. Now, you didn't have an energy cost to it, so again, the EX Evolves got a boost because you didn't have to have an open energy, uh, which, I don't know, it felt like it made them a little more powerful, but it also made them a little more playable as well. Now, the Frieza required you to discard three cards, but once you got him out, it didn't really matter. Uh, he had critical and 30,000 power, which is decently respectable, so you could attack with him if you wanted to, and if your leader was a Red Frieza's army, your, you and your opponent couldn't play battle cards 30,000 or less unless you chose four cards in your life and crit them. It is really hard to play this game when you can't play any of your cards. Like, this guy, this guy coming out is terrible. Now, granted, there are easy ways to get around him. A lot easier than getting around the Gogeta. You can play anything that KOs battle cards. You can play anything that, you know, warps them, bounces them, whatever. So against a card like this, for example, the Father-Son Kamehameha from Union Force. That's the kind of stuff that I would like to use uh, against this particular kind of deck. Or even um, the new blue one from Set 7. That does the same thing, but bounces the card back to their hand instead. Either way, it gave you a way to easily get around that card. So it didn't feel like it was as overwhelming. You just had to either have the card or draw into the card if you ran it. Um, I, I remember playing against a deck that, that dropped this on me, and I really didn't know what to do because the, the way the deck played is everything was 30,000 power or less. Because, of course, you know most cards are not above 30,000 power. And then I go and top deck into the secret rare uh, Frieza BR from Clash of Fates. I'm like, oh, this is 40,000. I can play this. And and then you go ahead and proceed to win. So there are definitely ways to get around this card a lot more so than there are the Gogeta BR. Now, since they were limiting the leader and the energy level of the cards you could play in the deck, they had to give you a sufficient amount of support to even be able to play the deck. I As much as I hated... Zarbon and Dodoria in the original Dragon Ball Z and the Frieza Saga. I really hated them, but they were villains you were supposed to hate. And I did enjoy hating them. But these two, the Berry Blue and the Kikono, I just... They were so dumb, in my opinion. Their design is really shitty and really cheap, and like the armor, the new say in armor like it's it's kind of okay i guess but it just i don't know they just look so so sloppily designed compared to uh the members of frieza's army that we got in dragon ball z uh now the loyal kakono he was a four cost and when you comboed with him you got to choose a red extra card and add it back to your hand so gave you 10,000 power and you could get another card back so you were replacing himself uh, but it wasn't really a whole lot different than if you were to play uh, the Unbreakable Son Goku or the uh, the Villainy Cell uh, that did the same thing and just let you draw a card. You were still keeping the same card advantage either way. The other Kakono, the Fledgling, allowed you to choose a card in your hand, put it in the drop, and you could choose one of your opponent's cards and give it minus 5,000 power. That's even more useless, in my opinion, because <clears throat> aside from the fact if you did it early at the very beginning of the game, what's the point? The At best, you can KO, like, a one-drop. 
or a free blocker. Uh, but later in the game, what are you going to do? You might hope to lower one of their, their bigger battle cards and force them to have to combo a little bit more to press damage, but it just seems so... It just seems so shitty, in my opinion. The berry blue cards were a little bit better, I suppose. Um, you had the four drop quick strike or quick shift, which is like the other, all the other quick shifts. You chose uh, two cards in your hand, shuffle them in your deck, and then draw two cards. And it wasn't really like I don't know. To me, I never felt like you were gaining anything from that ability. Now the five drop, on the other hand, the negotiator was a good bit better uh, when you played it. You got to choose one of your opponent's battle cards, twenty five or less, ignoring barrier, and take it. That's a lot of options that you can take. Now, again, especially if you go first, you're up that energy, you, there's a good chance you're going to take anything that they have. Whether or not they have anything you want to take is a separate story, but this one actually seemed to have a good purpose and didn't seem like it was just a garbage card in the deck. Unfortunately, you had to have Freeze's army cards for the leader, and I didn't like that, but... If you didn't care about that negate ability, then you could just not run any of these. You could run the Unbreakable Gokus, you could run the um, the Villainy Cells. Uh, you could also run cards like the, the Topo, or the, uh, the new event pack uh, Gohan, that's a counter. Uh, we got the new, the new Topo that's coming out of Draft Box 4 that's a 4-drop. Like, you had options. Uh, and, you know, it's not like there were bad options. There were other good options, too, that you could play in this deck. But it just it just felt like... It honestly, it felt so linear. Just because your goal was literally to just stall until you could play uh, the big 7-drop Frieza. Unless I'm missing something, or unless there's a build that I am not aware of, I don't have the time to follow every single tournament uh, and all the regionals and that stuff. I'm trying to get to the point where we're better with that. But as I don't really know a lot of people that play competitive and go kind of out of their way, I'll, I'm trying to trying to work on some collaborations with some some other YouTubers that I have mutual respect for, and you know maybe we'll get there. But for right now, we just have you know what we have to go off of, and I haven't seen anything that's particularly outlandish. Uh, all I know is that Frieza Prison is still one of the top tier decks. And uh, probably for good reason, because it's just annoying as shit. We also got two really good extra cards to go along with the leader as well. Uh, the first one, the scatter, to let you look at the top seven cards. You have to add two Freeze's Army, and you cost four or more, add them to your hand. And that's another reason why I feel like I, I couldn't play the deck the way it was meant to be played. Because I don't really like the red Freeze's Army cards. For the most part, they just, they're not good. I mean, I can still play the scatter, because I mean, they're still... A playset of the four drop, a playset of or the four drop, a playset of the seven drop Frieza, uh, the EX of all Frieza, uh, the five drop Berry Blue. So it's like I had options, but I felt like it wasn't enough options, or it wasn't the optimal amount for you to be running. Uh, the Live to Fight Another Day, on the other hand, was a really interesting card that I feel like is one of the better cards in the deck that gave it a lot of power uh, because it basically shut your opponent down. Unless they were willing to drop three cards. Which is a lot. Especially if you're already playing another card. Because that's going to put you at four cards that you're losing out of your hand. It's still only losing three card advantage. But that's a, a, that's a lot to deal with. And, I mean, you get to draw a card out of it too. Which, <clears throat> I mean, is nice. It replaces itself. Uh, but it, it basically didn't allow your opponent to play during that next turn because it had to be 25,000 like you had to play you're looking at at least a four or five drop more than likely a five drop it just it's one of those cards that you you basically know you're just gonna be skipping your turn and I mean you got you could got the option to play extra cards of course but you weren't gonna be playing any battle cards and if you didn't have anything you weren't really attacking which only just kind of fueled their ability to to stall the game out even longer so they can get out the EX Frieza and basically just sit there and do nothing. It was just, it's so, ugh. It was so monotonous. It felt like playing against U7 Frieza all over again. 
Now, it seems like every set, red gets better and better, not because of the archetypes or anything that come with each set, but because of the support cards that we get. Easily two of the best cards that we've gotten in quite a while, especially for red, was Transcendent Strike, and is that all you got? Transcendent Strike was a one-cost extra card, just required a red leader, you KO an opponent's battle card with 20,000 or power or less. So, any time up to turn 4, you were going to just devastate anything they had in the board, bar cards with barrier. Uh, so, it was, it was kind of like having uh, a Father-Son Kamehameha for red. Uh, but then we also had another just spectacular counter card for red, and is that all you got? You got to negate the attack, and if you dropped a red card from your hand, you got to choose two of your opponent's battle cards, and they both got minus 15,000. That right there could KO two of your opponent's cards. You go two for two, so it's a break even, but you're also negating that attack. And it just felt like red was just getting better and better and better, especially if you were playing a red Saiyan. Because we first we had... We already had a amazing uh, counterattack card with Unending Awakening. They basically gave your leader a Sensu Bean effect. Then we had the After Image technique that didn't negate the attack, but gave you such a boost and could potentially KO some of your opponent's battle cards in the process. And then, now here with, is that all you've got? And that's, that's really powerful red negates. Now in set 7, we've also got Denial of Hope. So it's almost like red has so many options that it's, it's easily becoming one of the best colors in the game. A lot of people still say blue is the best color, and I don't disagree with that. But I definitely feel like red is starting to become at least number two like green green is one of those things that it, it gets nice cards but it still feels like it doesn't get enough like it's i don't know green just feels like the card that even since set one like you had the broly stuff but then you had like the random saiyan stuff set two you had androids but then you had the random saiyan stuff and it felt like green was always lacking and now this kind of definitely adds to that because here, red is getting all this extra support, and while green is getting support as well, it just, it doesn't, if, if you're not looking at your deck and going, which of these cards do I want to run versus what can I run, then that's when you know when a, a color is really getting the support it needs. When I look at a red leader, and I'm sitting there going, I could run 12, uh, 12 counterattacks. I probably shouldn't, but I could. And because it's me, I'm going to try it anyways. But like that's when you have so many cards that you can't decide what to put in or you can't find room for everything, that's when you know a color or an archetype is really getting uh, the support it needs and gives you the variety to play your own way. Green is one of those colors I don't feel has that. Uh, same thing with yellow. That's why I feel like those are the two weakest colors. Black is one of those colors that... I feel like it has enough support, and you can more easily run any color with black because uh, none of the black cards have a specified energy cost. So red is definitely up there if it's not uh, number one, uh, and the color wheel is definitely number two in my opinion.